This is Jessica. And this is Kelly. And this is the Chasing Brighter podcast. I'm very excited about how my hair looks great. You know what else makes your hair look great, Jess? Washing it. (laughs) The um, Warrior Strong Wellness Collagen Peptides and Bone Broth. I've noticed a huge difference with just the health of my hair. I just have naturally thin hair. So Collagen is so good for hair, nails, skin. Check out warriorstrongwellness.com for their collagen peptides and bone broth or their multi-collagen protein powder. If you use the Chasing Brighter code, all one word, Chasing Brighter, you can get 10% off of your purchase. Hi, everyone. Joining us today is Tamara Robinson, an international best-selling author, coach, and speaker. Through her best-selling books, and coaching practice called Passion Pleasure Coach, Tamara helps men and women navigate feelings of being overwhelmed, experiencing pain after heartbreak or a major event. Through her own journey, Tamara's learned how to love and accept and celebrate herself. Her writing and coaching inspires others to do the same so they can live their lives to their full potential. Hi, Tamara. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Yes, welcome. Thank you. So we were just talking um, before we kick this off about your amazing books. And I think um, for us, what we wanted to hear, we know a little bit about your journey, but we wanted you to be able to share that with our listeners. So, you know, wanted to have you kind of share a little bit of your journey um, in terms of how you came to be the passion pleasure coach. <laughs> well, oh, wow. It's been, it's been a journey. It has been. Um, so how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> as far as you're comfortable. As far as I'm comfortable. Okay. Well, um, I'll go back to a little bit of childhood. Um, I grew up in Miami, Florida. I live in Maryland now, but I grew up in Miami, Florida and um, I'm an only child. And both of my parents are retired from the school system. So education Mm -hmm. was very important growing up Um, and religion was very important growing up. So I would say we spent a lot of time at church, um, Sunday school and regular church and then um, uh, evening church, you know, mm-hmm. evening church on Sundays, um, Bible study on Wednesdays and choir practice on Thursdays. <laughs> we were always at the church. And um, I believe I spent a majority, if not all my summers at vacation Bible school um, during the summer. Uh, that was my summer activity. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so church was very important. Um, family is very important as well. We're very touchy feely family, very, lots of love in the family. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were a lot of rules, I guess you can imagine because of, because of growing up in the church Mm -hmm. and, um, and since education was important, I, I, I did, I did attend college. I went to Georgia. I went to college in Georgia and, um, still continued going to church. It was, there was a church, there was a, a chapel on campus and, and I would attend church. Um, I, I believe that it was once I got into adulthood is when I started to view church a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Um, Not necessarily question anything. I wasn't really questioning the doctrine or questioning what I was learning because I still believe in God. I still read my Bible. I still pray and meditate. That's something that's not mentioned a lot in the church is meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe that prayer and meditation is like two way communication. Prayer is me communicating with God and meditation is me getting quiet to hear that to get an answer to my prayers. So that's not talked about a lot (laughs) in church, but um, I would say that um, I continued going to church even through college and after I graduated. And then once I moved to Maryland and got married, we were very, we continued that tradition of going to church all the time. And um, I was married for 10 years, I believe. And at year five, my daughter was born. Um, And uh, I like to say that the marriage was terrible but we co-parent very well so um and i believe at this point we've been divorced i think i've been divorced longer than we were married i think we're on year 12. wow but what a blessing that you're able to co-parent well well that's what i wanted because i have a really great relationship with my dad and i wanted my daughter to have a great relationship with her dad even if we couldn't be together i wanted her to still feel towards her dad the way that I feel about my dad. And then I also forget, I, it was a, a lot of forgiveness, a lot of, you know, just starting, just just 
realizing that I needed to do this for her. You know, it wasn't about what I experienced in the marriage or whatever took place. It, I turned all my attention to her. So I really worked hard on um, creating that relationship so that we could co-parent very well. And now, you know, my daughter is um, a freshman in college. She's 19, she'll be 19 on Saturday, actually. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And um, so it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's been a very interesting journey. Um, as far as how I became the passion pleasure coach, I would say that journey started, I always point to my, when I turned 40, For, it mm -hmm. seemed like when I turned 40, I, I'm 48 now, so when I turned 40, it just seemed like I was more focused on self, like I, I the self-care was starting, like I was, had been, by the time I was 40, I had been divorced for five years. So I think I started to practice self-care. My daughter was a little bit older. So. They started to get more independent. Exactly. That's what Kelly and I talk about. Kelly and I are in our 40s. And so we're like hoping to help people where they don't have to turn 40 and then be like, oh, self-care. Because that's exactly. kind of where we're at. You know, we're like, oh, yeah, let's care for ourselves. Yeah. So maybe you could learn that earlier. You know, I'm teaching that to, to my daughter and my son. how you give but... it up. I don't, I give don't, it it's up just completely. like a slow roll in some way, but it's then it's hard to take it back. It's hard to really make that time and make it a priority. Exactly. So, I think it's so natural for women. I see. So I have a, a daughter, she'll be um, 15 and then I have two boys and I just see her automatically being a nurturer, caring for them. Do, like she'll do their chores. She'll do all of these things. And I'm trying to guide her like, let's not do that. Let's not over function. Let's not over function for everyone. Let's listen right. to you, listen to your gut. Um, so we can kind of cut that out, you know? Yes, definitely. And I, and I, that's interesting that you mentioned that because I, because I, um, focused on myself and I took, and I took time for self-care. I was also setting the example for my daughter. So now that she, especially now that she's in college, she's learned that self-care is very important. Mm -hmm. Um, and she's added it. She, it's a part of her routine now as well. Um, but I would say definitely when I turned 40, she was about nine or 10 years old. So I, I maybe I felt like I had some time for yeah. myself, like I could, you know, make time for myself. And um, I started to just explore just um, how I felt about sex. I don't even remember, I can't even pinpoint exactly what I, maybe I, I think I read a, read a blog or something about orgasms and sexuality. And can I say that, can I say that? Yeah. Orgasms? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think I read a blog post about orgasms and sexuality, and it was just information that I had never read before. I had never yeah. um, seen it. And I just started to study the female orgasm and it just made sense. I just, you know, and I, I guess things started to click, you know, connections started to be made within and um, it just started, it just made sense. And then I started taking up pole dancing classes. Um, dance, I would say this oh, dance fun. has always been a part of my life. Uh -huh. Dance is my first love from when my parents put me in ballet classes at the age of three. I've danced in, in some way um, throughout my life in high school, in the high school band, in college, I was a part of a dance team. I've even done liturgical um praise dancing in church. Mm -hmm. um, and then I decided I was going to take pole dancing <laughs> classes. It's a natural and progression. It was a, yeah, it's a very natural <laughs> progression. And there was, I, I will say this, there was a time when I was, um, I was leading a dance ministry uh, at church. And then after church, I'd go to my pole <laughs> <That's dancing awesome>. <laughs> class. Because <laughs> that was my exercise at yeah, the time. That was my yeah. form of exercise. So, um, but yeah, it, it's all, it's like it all came together, studying orgasms and then pole dancing. And the pole dancing was for fitness. It was a women's mm -hmm. like, it was a thing room. for a while. I remember yeah, it's, having it's it in really, Chicago, they were like popping up. Oh yeah, it's, it's really, it, it's, and it's a great workout too. And it's funny after, during the pandemic, when everything shut down and I couldn't go to pole class, I bought a pole for my house. So now I can take online oh, classes awesome. or practice in between, <laughs> practice yeah. in between. Um, and so I guess what took me from there to becoming the passion pleasure coach is the journey that I took myself on. I wanted to then help other people and initially my coaching was for moms was basically for women like me at the time were moms mm -hmm. who were learning how to make time for themselves and it eventually evolved into sex and intimacy coaching once i got um, took a certification course um, to become a sex love and relationship coach i realized that 
it's almost like once I took that course and once I started to really start coaching um, in the sex and intimacy space, I felt like I found my people. Like this is where I'm supposed to be. I think I was playing it safe with coaching moms. Like, oh, mm -hmm. we, we can mm -hmm. talk about love a little bit. We can sprinkle a little bit, but we're talking yeah. about self-care. But it's like once I started to focus on sex and intimacy, it just made sense to me. And it's just clicked like everything, like things that happen for me, it just clicks. And when it, when it clicks, it just feels good. <laughs> so, so tell us about like, so, you know, hearing your journey and then kind of jumping to that, right? Like you felt drawn to that. What, when you look back, even like in your twenties, um, maybe it was before or during your marriage or whatever, but like, what are the things that you feel like, you know, now, you know, that you've learned that you didn't maybe because I think part of our journey is understanding ourselves and taking that time. I think that's part of self-care, right? Is really spending time with yourself. Like what do you discover that you really didn't, maybe weren't able to attend to? Um, that it's okay to talk about sex. Um, Cause even now with my, like with my daughter, um, she knows what I, what I do. And I started doing this while she was in high school. So she know well, I started coaching when she was in middle school, but then it, it eventually evolved into sex and intimacy coaching when she was in high school. And it allowed me to talk more openly with her than, mm -hmm. than I was, cause I, sex wasn't talked about when I was growing up. Um, I, we barely, I mean, we did talk about my menstrual cycle. I, I like my mom talked about it. She told me what was going to happen, but I didn't, I don't think I felt like I could really ask her questions. So, yeah, I mean, we, we feel the same way. And I, I went through sex therapy myself in terms of really understanding and being okay with pleasure because I, we grew up very Catholic and, um, in, I always say we grew up in the Bible Belt. So we grew up in Kansas, um, Southern Kansas. It's very religious. It doesn't matter what, like you were talking about, right? It doesn't matter like what religion you were necessarily. Everybody went to church. Everybody did all the things that church did. They did the church sports and the youth groups and all the things, right? Right. But um, there was like shame to me. I felt like I grew up with shame associated with sex or like you don't talk about it. People are married. There's like this secret. I guess you talk about it when you're married and you have to wait till you're married and there's nothing in between when you're tell that. Right. And then right. you have to all about it out. <laughs> doing it to like make babies. Right. Exactly. The concept of it being part of just your own sexual health and your own well being, I didn't, I didn't know that. Right. Until didn't I get was that memo. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. I didn't know that you could have sex for pleasure. I thought sex was just for procreation, just for having making babies. That's that's what I grew up right. believing. And it's unfortunate. I, I I don't really know how you can incorporate sex into the church. I'm kind of I'm trying to figure that out. I'm going to work on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there has to be a way because you have to be if there is there's a lot of pleasure that you can have when it comes to sex and intimacy and you you need to have that and that's another thing that i learned is that i can have pleasure that the that the the act of sex is not just for my partner or my husband at the time um it's not just for him it's for me as well i need to be pleasure i need to have i need to experience pleasure and i need to know what brings me pleasure and i believe that that's why when we when we talk about sex and intimacy it's not just with another person it's yes. feeling intimate and feeling that pleasure within yourself yeah, yeah i mean the that's first a very american experience too yes. i think pleasure for women are the the non-existence of pleasure for women and in in the hookup culture mm -hmm. of young women and girls not having orgasms not knowing what their vagina looks like not knowing anything and then just you know um having sex to get over with. Yes. Just for him. I'm, I'm doing yeah. it for him. I'm doing it for mm -hmm. my partner. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, and yeah, you mentioned knowing what their vagina looks like. Yeah, I did. I had never, <laughs> I had never looked at <laughs> You mm -hmm. have to, I believe that every woman should put a mirror down there and just see what it looks like. Like that's, you know, I, that's just my advice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have one of my best friends is, uh, well, she's not anymore, but she was a labor and delivery nurse and she went to nursing school and she had to go through the gynecological She's still your rotation. best friend. She's just not. She's still my best friend. No, yeah, no. she's not. She's she not works in a plastic now. surgeon's office now. She's way off. She, but she worked for years and years in a labor okay. and delivery. And, um, 
anyway, so she had to do the gynecological, like the pelvic exams and stand in there when she was a student. And I remember her telling me like, oh my gosh, like everyone is different colors and looks different. And there are dots and polka dots. I was like, what? There are dots? You know, she was like, yeah, "Yeah, like everyone looks so different and it's crazy. And I just remember, you know, how how would I know? What did you see the picture from the sex ed book or whatever? And you just assume everyone's looks. It reminds me of that. Fried green right. tomatoes. Have you both seen fried green tomatoes? And they gave them a mirror, and that's what they were supposed to do uh-huh. um, was to explore themselves. And um, everyone thought that was kind of crazy. But yeah, I mean, I but I I think it is it, it's interesting. Obviously, we weren't raised that way, but it would make sense. Like, how are you engaging in physical sexual intimacy with another person and mm-hmm. not knowing yourself? Right. I mean, you're going to look in your mouth and look at your hands, look at your feet. You know, you're gonna, you're looking all over yourself and you're not going to know what you look like, but you're, you know, engaging in sexual intimacy. Exactly. Yeah. It's very important to know your body. Um, like even with my daughter going back to her and, and teaching her about her menstrual cycle, the first thing I told her was to take a mirror and look like you need to know what's happening in your body. And that's why I, my advice, if, if you're comfortable, if women are comfortable is to, is to do that. That's a very intimate part of our lives. And I know for myself growing up, I, it was almost like I was taught to ignore that part of my body. Mm-hmm. Like even during the menstrual cycle or, you know, whether it, I guess I was taught as a child or when I was growing up, you're going to have your menstrual cycle once a month, you need to clean yourself and that's it. Like there was nothing, there was no, I was not taught to feel connected to, to either my breast or my vagina. Like I was just not taught to feel connected to those areas. And I believe that's part of the awakening that took place when I was 40. There was something I don't, and I, I it's, it's so funny. I can't, I'm not able to pinpoint the a exact specific moment, moment. The specific mm-hmm. moment. I believe it was just, just things that were just, ha- just, I do know that it was a blog post that I wrote, that I read mm. that was talking about female orgasm. And I'm like, oh, what is like what does that mean i don't even know what that i didn't know i don't know what an orgasm feels like i don't know you know have i ever experienced an orgasm so i went through that whole process and that just led me to wanting to study the female orgasm and that led me to um the pole dancing classes which i believe connected me more to my femininity Mm -hmm. um through the pole dancing classes because it's very it's i mean obviously you keep your clothes on because it's it's a it's a workout it's a it's an exercise class but um, you do things like caressing your body, touching your skin and, and, you know, like sensual. Yes. It's Mm -hmm. sensual and sexy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even just feel like feeling sexy and being okay with feeling sexy is something that I have a hard time with still to this day. Right. Mm -hmm. Is like, I want to look cute or I want to look sexy, but I actually don't want to be said, be called sexy or be, you know, any attention for it. (laughs) It's like, it's uncomfortable for me. And it's like, how does one as a woman, how do you just own who you are and just be proud of that? That's why I think you're such an inspiration is just hearing your story and helping women take this journey and men too, in terms of like, you Mm -hmm. can be sexy and that's good. And it's, there's not shame associated with it or, you know, all those Mm -hmm. other kind of like negative feelings that for some reason, growing up in a more conservative kind of like religious environment, like that doesn't, it's like, you feel like it's not okay. Yes, it's it's true. And I, I think that when it comes to feeling sexy or looking sexy, it's what it's, I think you have to look at what your definition of sexy is. What does that mean? Or are you basing that off of what someone else is doing or what someone else is wearing? And I think that's that's when it makes a little bit more sense is when we clearly define, well, what does sexy mean for me? Like, mm-hmm. what would I have to put on or what would I have to do to feel sexy? Because I, I feel sexy all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, because I don't have a, there's not one, it's it's how I feel about myself. It's yes. how I feel about my body. Um, Cause I've, I mean, when I was younger, I used to, I can't even, I look at pictures of myself now, like when I was younger and I'm thinking, I used to think my thighs were big. Like what, what is that? Like, I used to oh, think I that. Yeah. <laughs> Things like, I can what? tell my eight year old, 18 year old body. Right. Exactly. Or 25 right. year old body. And I just had to learn to love myself. And mm-hmm. I think that when you have that internal love and compassion and sense of even sense of intimacy and pleasure within yourself then it's like the sexiness just comes from within and it's not necessarily something that you put on 
or something that you wear or, or anything like that but what, clearly what defining has, it mm -hmm. what has helped you learn to love yourself or what do you recommend for others right who are you know um struggling with feeling lovable feeling desirable how do we begin that i would say it first it starts with self love self love mm -hmm. self compassion and self care um and that can either be in the form of doing things that bring you pleasure whether it's it could be meditation it could be taking a walk outside it doesn't have to be sexual that could that might be too far of a jump for for some people it could just be taking time to do what you love like i love to dance so that's my happy place and i love to be near water so if i if i feel like i need a little pick me up I, there's a lake not too far from my house and i'll drive there and just sit and just look at it or if i'm home i'll turn on some music and just dance around the house um it's it's the little things it's not it, when you're just getting started on your self-love journey it's not it's baby steps i would say that you taking baby steps is the most important thing instead of trying to jump to I want to feel sexy. You know, it's it's like take little baby steps to get to that point. What would you say to someone who's especially um, let's say a mom who just had a baby, maybe the baby's getting a little more independent and they're just like literally coming out from under their rock and they they're like they don't even know what they love. How how do you how would they kind of help figure out like I don't even know what I like enjoy anymore kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Right, because you feel like everything is yes. focused on that baby. Um, well, first, if you have help, if she has help, I would say, you know, either allow your partner, your spouse or a family member to to watch the baby so that you can have time for yourself. Mm -hmm. And whether you, like for me in the beginning, it was taking a bubble bath like that was a big deal oh, for me <laughs> to take I a bubble that. bath <laughs> um, or even taking a nap. Sometimes taking a nap is a form of self-care, especially for a new mom, but you don't want to spend all that time napping. But I would say ask for help. That was one of the hardest things for me mm -hmm. as a new mom was asking for help. So carve but, out the time so you can discover exactly. what it is. Exactly. Take some time. And then if you, if you feel like it, maybe journal, maybe journal some ideas so that when you do have that time again, you can have your journal notes to look back on to know you know, oh, what do I feel like doing today? Oh, maybe I want to take a walk today, or maybe I want to, mm -hmm. you know, um, meditate today, or take a bubble bath. You know, anything mm -hmm. that brings you joy and pleasure. Yeah, yeah. And so okay. we want to kind of explore what you know, what is sexy mean for me, right? And then we're working on self love, and we're feeling more confident. What are some more steps that we can make in our pleasure journey? Um, once you've connected with self care and self pleasure, um, knowing what you really want, connecting with your desires. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes, especially when we're in partnerships, we put all the focus on our partner, instead of really knowing and understanding what makes us happy. So I would say connecting with your desires is a is a really good exercise. Like like what and sometimes there could be a block and that's something that I work with with my clients is is understanding where those blocks are and why you may have those blocks or maybe even allowing yourself to um allowing yourself to have or experiencing those pleasures because sometimes especially as women we don't feel we deserve something mm -hmm. so we so that's usually a block that could be a block is not feeling that you deserve something so that could that might actually be the step before connecting with your desires is is knowing that you deserve pleasure you know i i it's i find um also like um our, our libido kind of going up and down. I mean, there were definitely times. So I've um, been married. Kelly, you tell me what, what, how long have I been like 20? Oh, we decided 24, 24 years. We've been together, whatever. Okay. And, um, you know, desire and, and sex drive ebbs and flows, but there was a time and I felt like all my girlfriends, you know, we had little ones and we were like, I could never have sex again and be fine. And it makes me so sad that I said that. And it makes me so sad that we all felt that way. And because everyone felt that way, it, it really felt like, oh, you become a mom and you don't 
ever have sex again and it's, you don't have a desire anymore and and that part of you is dead the end and like that was supported by all of my peers and so you know what can we do when we feel you know i don't i don't have a desire i got to check this box for my partner um how can we you know kind of build that desire back up um well is it well the first question would be do you do you still want to have sex because mm-hmm. maybe i mean it's it's perfectly normal to go through those changes. I would say acknowledge the changes and allow yourself to feel all the feelings. That's a lot of, that's some of the work that I do also is is yeah. helping my clients feel everything that they're feeling and not ignoring those feelings. Because yes, when you when you become a mom, you, because you've, your body has been through so much, you may, you there could be a period of time where you don't feel like um, being intimate anymore. But then when you realize that you are ready to be intimate, I would say, um, what does that, is, is the, is the level of intimacy the same as before you had children? Mm-hmm. Um, because that can change too. And being open to that, to the change, because the way that I have sex now is not the way that I had sex when I was in my twenties, because my body's different. Um, you know, my, my knees hurt. <laughs> so body certain body hear, parts yeah. hurt. <laughs> you know, and I'm okay with that because I just adjust. I make adjustments um, based on you know whatever it is that I'm doing. But I've learned to not to not be hard on myself because we are all going through changes. Like I know that pretty soon in a couple of years I'll be going through menopause. I don't think I've started yet, but I know that brings its own level of of changes. But I would I would connect to who you are right now yeah. instead of trying to connect to the level the type or the level of sex you had before children because that's going to be that will be different especially if your children are younger stop that comparison game and i would say for me and i know sometimes i I know people are like so tired of self-care and self-compassion you know that's not the key to everything but when i look back I really think it was like one more thing that wanted something from my body. You know, I breastfed my children. And so I, because I chose to do that, they had to be with me kind of, or around me or close to me, or I had to be near them a lot. And so it was like, oh, this little thing's on my body. And when I finally have a break, it's like, oh God, one more thing that wants to, you know, use my body. So that was me having an empty cup, right? I know now looking back, right? You're not caring for yourself. You're not doing for you. Then you're going to be empty, you know, for your partner. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also read, I don't know, I I read a long time ago. um, And I don't know if that's stuff that you talk about in your, in your business, but like women who masturbate actually have an an increase and desire and then have more sex with a partner. Is that yes. something that you have an ex- experience with or? I do. I do. Yeah. Um, and actually that's part of the pleasure because, the, and that's why I always say it, it starts with you first. You have to f- feel that level of intimacy and pleasure within yourself. And you also have to know how to bring yourself to pleasure, how to bring yourself to the orgasm. Yeah. And then also redefine what orgasm. There's so many different levels. It's, it's really, a, a lot of it is about redefining what orgasm is, redefining what pleasure is, because a lot of the times we look at movies or porn or mm-hmm. friends or whatever, or books. You know, I, I remember reading a lot of romance novels when I was in my 20s. And that's, it, whether it's real or not, um, most of the time it's not, we can't base our experience on that, on that situation. So I, I like to say that, yes, masturbation, self-pleasure is very important because then we can find out, we can learn what brings us pleasure mm-hmm. because then whether you're, if you're not in a, in a relationship, you don't have to, you can still experience pleasure. You can st- still experience sexual pleasure as a single person. And then when you are in a relationship, you can then tell your partner what brings you pleasure, like touch me here or, you know, do this. And, and then that way it, it is, it is a, it is another level of communication between the two of you because you're able to then communicate what you like instead of just taking whatever, whatever comes your way. So I I would say that self-pleasure and masturbation are very important um, because it can strengthen your level of intimacy and pleasure within Mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah. And I think I never really realized how important those things were until you really, if you're in a relationship with another person, you realize or when you're with another person too, how do they know what you like? I think that would just like, it hit me one day where I was like, nobody has some sort of magical 
book on reading the other person's minds and everybody is very different and, um, finding out how to even learn to communicate with your partner about what you like can be hard too. Mm -hmm. Um, what advice do you have for, for people with that, with regard to even sharing, like what you like or don't like, how do they kind of get up the courage if they're a little more timid of that? Um, I would, well, at first I wouldn't necessarily have that conversation during sex. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it then. Um, cause I can kind of break the mood, but okay. you know, maybe after, you know, after dinner or when you're just having quiet time after the children are asleep or they're in a different room, um, maybe discuss, well, this, how do you, are you maybe, maybe ask the question of your partner to get the conversation started instead mm -hmm. of, instead of you just jumping in saying what you don't like or what you do like, because I, and I would say this, preface it with what you do like, start with what you do like, what you do enjoy, and then maybe, um, mm provide what you like the sandwich method to get like the conversation you, you know, yeah to get the conversation say something started. good say what you want to say and then say something good. exactly <laughs> so it's like you know, I like when you do this no don't start it that way <laughs> don't start it that way but i i would actually start off with a question like what do you enjoy about our sexy time what do you enjoy about do you like when i do this and then that will their response will allow you to then say what you like or what you enjoy. I like when you touch me here. I like when you kiss me this way. I really, or you can then, that might even start the conversation of trying something new. Even if it is something that you read in a book or in a magazine or um, you saw somewhere else. Oh, I, you know, I heard this person had this, had this toy. Maybe I want to, maybe you want to add toys into your partnership. And definitely if you, if you are doing that, I would say with toys specifically, make sure you let your partner know that this is not in replacement. There's not a replacement for them. This is to enhance mm -hmm. the experience because the toy can possibly do something that they can't at the same time that they're, you know, mm -hmm. like if, if you're having intercourse, then you can put the, the toy, like the rose, you can put the toy on your clitoris. They, they may not be able to stimulate both parts of you at the same time, but this mm -hmm. will just enhance your experience because mm -hmm. um, some women orgasm from clitoral um, stimulation and some from vaginal stimulation. So if you can have both, then your partner is enjoying the the vaginal stimulation while you're enjoying the clitoral and everyone's happy. So um, so yeah, I, I think if um, if you are already having sex, then the conversation should be easy. You should the conversation should be easy because both of you should want to please each other. Yeah, and so I like what you're saying is like make that conversation about pleasing each other. Yes. Right. Not just like an agenda, like here's what we needs to change for me, but like, Hey, you know, what, what feels good for you and what, what's your favorite thing we've done together? Um, exactly. Do you have any fantasies? Um, I, I wanted to just to circle back to when you said we need to redefine the orgasm. Yes. Um, how do we redefine the orgasm or, or what exactly does that mean? Um, redefining it, meaning that your or the way that you orgasm or the way that you express orgasm, because I we, we don't know how other people feel when they orgasm, but the way that you express orgasm could be completely different and it will be completely different than what you see in a movie or what you see during porn, because porn is completely false. Like, right. don't, I would, right. I would say, don't learn from, about sex. From don't porn. use it as a reference. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking about the movie, um, when Harry met Sally, when she was mm -hmm. in the deli mm -hmm. and she, and she's yeah. doing, you know, and she's like, you know, and she's, is, is an orgasm like that? It could be, I don't know, but some people are quiet. Sometimes an orgasm can be a, a completely internal experience. Mm -hmm. And when you communicate that, um, when you when you know of that, when you when you're aware of that within yourself, and that's where the self pleasure comes in, then you know that okay, maybe I don't need to scream, maybe I don't need to um, move around, you mm -hmm. know, when I'm having an orgasm. Maybe my orgasm, maybe I'm just still. Maybe maybe if I'm still, I can experience a deeper level of orgasm. Mm -hmm. And I would say also let your partner know that as well, because I've I've dated I've dated guys where. Um, I didn't 
express myself with an orgasm. And he kept asking me, did you orgasm? Did you come? Did you orgasm? I said, I did, but I don't know how to, ex I, I, I expressed it in a way that felt good for me. And so communicating that with your partner um, is very important, but yes, you have to, you have to, redefining it just means knowing what the orgasm feels like to you and how mm -hmm. you express it. And, and, great. and not comparing yourself to someone else. Well, cause yeah. I, I, it's like the other person's expecting some, like this massive act or event or something when it may not always be. That's great. I, I don't know you're right, people realize you're getting, that. Yeah. References from movies and Thanks. all of those things. Yeah. And that's and also Ryan. like you're saying your partner is like, oh, did you orgasm or, you know, like, yes. Okay. You know, like right. if you have someone determined to get you there and they're thinking again, because none of us know anything, right. They're referencing pornography or they're referencing a movie. And so, you know, they don't know what that looks like for you. Right. Right. And like, like my partner now that it's like, there's a connection that we have and it's, I don't even have to tell him, like, we don't, we're able to communicate through our bodies, like our bodies react to each mm -hmm. other. And so he doesn't, he doesn't ask me, well, did you come? Well, he, cause he knows. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I've been able to express to him like what makes me feel good and what, mm -hmm. what I, what I like and what I don't like. And so we have that, we have a really good um, open communication about, about intimacy which is really great. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Communication is important in any aspect of relationship. So especially with sex and intimacy. Well, it's, it's like, we have to be vulnerable, right? We have to be vulnerable with ourselves yes, and yes. with our partner. And I, I do think, um, as Kelly and I have gone through the podcast and the more we interview people really, I mean, none of us, we just are kind of assuming the other person knows some things, right? <laughs> and it's like right. many of us, you know, again, this is like an American experience. I really do think, I don't think it's with a specific religion or area of the country. I really do think as we talk about it, it's an American experience that we don't talk about sex, right? And mm -hmm. that we are just making assumptions with the other person or knowing, and it's like, all of us are individually unique. And so we need to talk with our partners um, because just because they, let's say they've had more partners or they have more experience, they haven't experienced you. Right. Right. So they don't know you. So why mm -hmm. would we think they know any more? You know, it's like, you're almost starting from scratch with every partner, you know? That's true. That's true. And when it comes to communication, like think about a time when maybe for your birthday or anniversary when you didn't get the gift that you wanted or the gift that you thought you were going to get if you felt if you were upset about it did you ever express to your partner what you really wanted even something with a gift with you know something like that or maybe a chore around the house if if your partner didn't take out the trash or you know didn't did you did you express that did you talk about it and sometimes we think that our partners should know certain things but in order to in order to guarantee that they're aware of how we feel about something, we have to be able to communicate, communicate that. Yeah, and that's a great analogy. In a way where they can accept it. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. No, yeah. that's a great analogy. It's very true. Yeah. yeah. And it's, we, we expect for whatever reason, like nobody is really a mind reader when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. And then otherwise you're setting yourself up for disappointment too. That's so, true. you know, and even in terms of, you know, finding happiness or pleasure, all those things without sharing that, how do you, you're not serving yourself. You're doing yourself a disservice. Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah. Because if you're, if, if you've done all this work to, to understand what brings you pleasure, but then you don't share that with your partner, then you're only experiencing that pleasure by yourself. You're not, ex you're not, it's not a, a, jo a, a collective, a joint experience with your partner. Now, if that's what you're, if you're okay with that, then, you know, you can't really fault your partner for that. You could, you just, you know, get your toy or your, your hand or whatever, whatever you use to bring pleasure. And you can also do an en energetic orgasm. I learned how to, that's, that's, that's another level, energetic mm -hmm. orgasms where you're not touching your body at all. That's mm. a wonderful experience in itself. Um, but if you want to, if your desire, going back to desires, if your desire is to experience an intimate and level, an, a deeper level of intimacy with your partner, then communication has to be a part of that. Just like we discuss money with our partners or we discuss how to raise the kids or, you know, sex needs to be part of that discussion as well. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Absolutely. And like you're saying, the cornerstone 
for all of us is knowing yourself, defining all of these things for yourself and engaging in self-care. So you're filling your cup. Um, so, so then, you know, you have the energy to, um, care for yourself. And if you're in a relationship, care for your partner as well. Exactly. Yeah. It all starts with self. The work that I do with my clients, um, if, if they come to me wanting, I want to have a better orgasm with my partner, or I want to have whatever, usually they come to me with a request that involves another, the other person, but majority of my work is with themselves is internal. Um, and it's, and it's interesting there's there have been times where halfway through the, the the coaching process their desire changes a little bit because once they connect with themselves they realize that the desire they initially came to me with was based on that other person but then we get we, we talk about the desire and talk about deserving that desire that's another mm -hmm. level um then their their desire or their end goal might change a little bit yeah. because now they're now they're completely focused on what they want right and then i walk them and then i help them through the steps of well now that you're here let's talk about how you can share this with your partner because sometimes that can be a little scary yeah. is once you once your desire changes um you know you have to learn how to share that share that new desire with your yeah. partner yeah mm -hmm. yeah and um do you just work with individuals or are there times where you end up working with a couple? I do work with couples, but I, I like to have separate sessions with couples mm -hmm. um, and then have and then come together. But um, yeah. but but yes, when I do work with a couple, I, I don't like all the sessions to be together. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if someone wants to work with you, what's the best way to connect with you? The best way to connect, connect with me um, is on Instagram. I'm Passion yeah. Pleasure Coach on Instagram, or you can go to my website, passionpleasurecoach.com. It has been such a pleasure to meet you and have you on today. Um, I'm I'm so excited uh, for you to to come and share your knowledge with us. Yeah, and, and like Thanks I said. You know, uh, your book live in love out loud is so great. Yes. Um, and right now it's, it's just a Kindle electronic version right now. Yes. Right now. Book? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And then I really want to check out some of your other books too. Um, like I said, you have a poem, um, in your book. And so it makes me want to read your I book of that. poetry. Yes. So I'm super excited to, to look at some more of the stuff that you've created. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yes. I love to write. So That's my other for joining passion. us. <laughs> thank yeah. you for having me. Thanks for listening and joining us today. And don't forget to follow us on social media at Chasing Brighter or on our blog, ChasingBrighter.com.